what is going on guys it has been a while since we've done one of these and we are back we're having another episode of that simple man's comics and friends that's right this is our podcast so if you're not subscribed make sure you check us out on itunes google play stitcher wherever those podcasts are found but as we always do put the video up here on the youtube channel like to introduce my co-host of course that most people know that is of course jack de mayo Thank you, Brian. Yes, excited to be here. Excited to be recording another podcast episode. And we've got a very special one. A lot of times when we do these podcasts, we've got two guests, we've got three guests. But here we only need one because we have the head man in charge. I'm talking about Ross Ritchie. Boom Studios CEO is here in the building with us at Simpleman's Comics. Howdy, howdy. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I feel like that episode of, uh, not episode, I feel like the movie Step Brothers, when he's got that katana signed, I'm like, you got a chance to get Ross Ritchie on the, on the channel. It's not, you're not going to get Ross Ritchie. We all love Boom yeah. Studios. And that watches us on this channel knows we're big fans of Boom Studios. So it's an honor to have CEO Ross on the channel. Ross, first, we want to welcome you. But we, for our viewers that may not be aware of you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and also the history of Boom Studios? Sure. So... Uh, we're famous for publishing Something is Killing the Children, Once in Future, We Only Find Them When They Were Dead, uh, Seven Secrets, uh, and, and a whole raft of stuff like Lumberjanes and uh, Giant Days and a, and a, and a bunch of uh, uh, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Power Rangers. Uh, now Power Rangers is uh, Power Rangers and Mighty Morphin, two different series. And so I started publishing in uh, 2005, but uh, just to tell you a little bit of, of my history. So going back um, about more than uh, 20, more like 25 years. So I got a film degree. I went out to Los Angeles to work in the movie business. I did that for a little while, which d sounds really exciting. But the truth of the matter was, was I was driving stars around in a car or sometimes an agent and so I was a production assistant. And then um, I got offered, I went to a comic book convention. I was a lifelong comic book fan, always been a huge comic book collector. And I went to a comic book convention and I got offered a um, job to work at a company called Malibu Comics. And Malibu was publishing a series, uh, a line of superheroes called the Ultraverse that a lot of your readers might remember. And so I um, took the job because I had to pay my bills and I had some credit cards to pay. And uh, the result was I got to work with uh, these legends in the business, like Jim Starlin, who created the Infinity Gauntlet and um, Thanos. And I got to work with Howard Shaken and Walter Simonson and Kevin McGuire and uh, Barry Windsor Smith and Steve Englehart and, 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 and. There was probably like 15 creators that were some of the greatest uh, in the business. And uh, after Marvel bought Malibu, I decided it was a good time to leave the company and go uh, work, uh, uh, go back to work in the movie business. And I landed a job as a reader for Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, uh, and what a reader is, is the person, when you submit a script to Arnold with an offer for him to star in a movie, uh, they, um, the agent doesn't actually read it. The agent has me read it. And then I read it and tell him what are the highlights and give him a one page summary. So I was a reader for Arnold and a bunch of other stars read a bunch of movies. Some got made, some didn't. It was a lot of fun. I thought and you were going to say Arnold couldn't read at first. Read it. <laughs> Arnold's brilliant, but I think you know that because yeah. the guy knows how to knows how to manage a career. So uh, you know he, he the interview he did with Tim Ferriss is very much worth listening to on on podcast form because uh, what, you find that, out how smart I, he is. I take it that was was that before or after his uh, Hercules or New York movie. <laughs> well, you know, here, Brian, you probably get a kick out of this. I, I could talk about Arnold for a minute, but the thing is, is a, a little bit after that, well before Conan, he was a millionaire. And he was a self-made millionaire from uh, doing construction work. Uh, he was he was a contractor. Wow. So I um, thought, like body, you know, bodybuilding and Mr. Olympia and stuff like that. But yeah, that uh, makes sense. You know what keeps you in shape is moving bricks, <laughs> yeah. right? So that was one of the reasons why he did it. But anyway, listen to the Tim Ferriss interview. It's, it's amazing. It's on the podcast. Find it online. But anyway, so I read for Arnold, and that gave me control of my own time. And so I hustled around as a producer optioning comic books to sell his movies, and I got involved. The thing that people would know is Matt Wagner uh, had a comic, classic comic called Mage, which is one of my longtime favorites. 
And so set up stuff uh, as a producer in Hollywood, developed a lot, things weren't getting made, got kind of frustrated. And so I decided that, you know, I had this background in comic books. I had a great uh, role at X. I got a phone call from Keith Giffen. So if people don't know, Keith Giffen co-created Lobo and did the funny Justice League and a bunch of comics that I loved. And we struck up a friendship and he asked me to write an image comic, believe it or not. So I wrote uh, an image book with Keith. I, Keith said, hey, I want you to write this comic. I said to Keith, Keith, you're a writer, but I'm not. And Keith said, hey, I want you to write this comic. And I said, hey, Keith, I don't think you're listening to me. I'm not a writer. And Keith said, I really want you to write this comic. So I said, okay, look, I'll write the comic. But the deal is, is when I suck, you rewrite me and I won't be mad at you. And I'm never going to have my heart broken. So I, the book was called Dominion. And basically, I got rewritten by Keith Giffen because I suck and I'm not a good writer. And uh, Keith rewrote me and made it a lot better. But uh, during the course of that, Keith basically um, talked me into, uh, you know, becoming a publisher and had recognized my talent uh, facility for it and really encouraged me. And I said, look, I'll start Boom, but the deal is you have to make comics, new original series, so that I can publish them because people know who Keith Giffen is, but they don't know who I am. And so Keith, uh, you know, for the, about the first year of publishing with Boom in 2005, everything was Keith Giffen. So... Um, but launched in 2005 out of my spare bedroom and have been publishing ever since. And it's been a great run. We, people, you know, we, Warhammer is coming out from Marvel now, but uh, we published Warhammer back in the day. It was one of our first big licenses. We also published Farscape during that era. And then the big thing that got everybody's attention in the 2009, 2010 era was we did the Disney licenses. And now I know I have Brian's attention. So we did uh, Pixar, we did the Muppets, and then those were, worked well enough that Disney came to us and pitched us on doing Mickey and Donald. And so we did that through that time period. And so that went really great. And then of course the biggie in 2012 was adventure time. And so that was a terrific um, sort of era. And then Lumberjanes came shortly thereafter. And then, um, you know, we bought Arkea, uh, another company that was publishing mouse guard. And so they were also publishing the Henson licenses like labyrinth and dark crystal. And so we bought that company and absorbed them and uh, they became an imprint. And uh, a little bit after that, we got the big Fox feature film deal and we started selling a lot of licenses. And I think what a lot of fans don't know is that we have a team that's dedicated to uh, doing media at Boom, doing film and TV every day, a group of people that get up and their sole function is to take care of our creators and uh, license film and TV projects. So right now we've got a first look with Netflix. A lot of people know that we, Mouse Guard was ready to be made by Fox when Disney bought Fox and Disney canceled the movie. And we pivoted very quickly into a deal with Netflix. And so that just got announced back in March. And obviously COVID has been going on. So that's been uh, slowing things down because you know they sporadically have been trying to start production. Uh, but uh, we, are, we have, we're, we're in process with Netflix having a lot of fun. It's really exciting. They um, really understand our material and they understand what Boom is about. And they're excited about us as a company. And I think we're going to have some exciting announcements to come out of it. Now, explain for anybody who doesn't understand what a first look deal entails. That's um, great. Like the one you've got with yes. Netflix. Yeah. So what a first look deal means is that you... Um, well, let's back up for a second and, and explain the process. So when we publish a comic book, we act as a producer. And what that means is, is we take the comic book and we go to all the talent agencies, CAA, William Morris, uh, UTA, and we package a writer or a director. And that's a long, complicated process. You have to be careful that you get the right writer that people are really excited about, who has a good feel for the material that wants to do the property justice. And then we take that package of the writer or the writer and the director. Sometimes there's a cast member. And then what we do is we're going to go shop it to the entire town. And the function of the first look is that Netflix believes that our material is going to be good enough and exciting enough that they want to have a prescribed deal structure. So basically, they don't want to get into a bidding war. 
And the way that they can prevent getting into a bidding war is by they have a, a, a deal that's made with us ahead of time. And we have to bring it to them. And then they get a certain window of time, like five days, 10 days, 15 days. That's all very standard where they get to sit there and go, hmm, this is really cool. This is super interesting. I wonder if um, we should buy this. And if they pass and decide not to buy it, then we're free to go everywhere in town. So an example of this is the Lumberjanes movie, excuse me, TV show. So we took the Lumberjanes uh, cartoon to Netflix and they passed. And we then got into a three-way studio bidding war and uh, HBO Max emerged on top. So now why did Netflix pass? I don't know. I wish I could have figured out a way to get them to buy it. I'd love to be a Netflix. I love my friends at HBO Max, so I have no complaints. So it all comes, you know, it all works out. But, you know, Netflix has the first look deal, so we're looking to please Netflix. Now, I will tantalize your, your, your audience with the fact that we have set up a project at every single major streamer. And I don't know this, but... I'm going to get a little bold, and I know that's crazy because I named my company Boom, that I would be bold. Bold move, Cotton. Yeah, <laughs> You didn't exactly. just name your company Boom. You threw an exclamation mark. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And this is where I will remind you that the name of the company is not Whimper. But <laughs> right. the, the, uh, we, uh, we have deals at every single streamer. So we have The Woods over at Peacock, uh, which has been previously announced. I, have, I love that book. It's an amazing book. It's absolutely incredible. It's been in development for four years over there. And I think a lot of that is attributable to, originally it was at Universal Content Productions, UCP. And you just saw over COVID, there was an announcement that we are doing a publishing venture with UCP, which again, I'm going to get out over my ski tips here, but I think we're the only com comic book company that's ever had a uh, television studio do a co-publishing co deal with them. Uh, but the uh, but UCP optioned the woods, and then uh, there was this consolidation that was happening because of the streamers. And so that's over at Peacock. We've got something at CBS All Access. We have something at HBO Max. We've got something at Disney Plus, which is just beyond the R.L. Stein show. That is being made. So that is going to come out next year. So that is a definitive uh, statement and a definitive timeline. Um, and I will tell you, we have a Netflix show in production. I'm not going to tell you what show it is uh, because Netflix assassins would come and murder me in my sleep. <laughs> so I so want, I want to tell you, but, but that's something exciting though. That's something exciting. So that means that lets me believe it's something big. So that's, I'm excited about that. That's new information. Nobody knows yes. that. I okay. will tell you, we have 20 movies and TV shows. And, and it, that are in development. And that's more, if you have a scorecard, if you want to go to, uh, you know, look at your scorecard, look at your app, look at your website, whoever's keeping track of those things, there's, that's about twice as many as has been announced. And um, I, I should, I should be quiet. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> We're going to let you talk. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, by the way, I do want to point out, you know, uh, I forgot Apple and the streamers. We just set up a Jake Gyllenhaal uh, project. And I will tell you, it is really freaking cool uh, to have Jake Gyllenhaal pitch your comic book. I bet. So I guess you could say another name for first look deal is also like right of first refusal, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, so I know. Talking about Disney, my family's part of that Disney vacation club. And one of the reasons that gave us that um, extra boost to buy into it is you know, for resale, but also Disney has right of first refusal where they, if you wanted to, heaven forbid, I, I don't see myself doing it, but if you wanted to resell your Disney vacation club, Disney gets that right of first refusal first where they'll buy it back for you before it hits the, the, the market. But yep. Yeah. And really the way uh, for your audience to process a first look deal is, you know, you as a production company, which Boom is serving as in this, in this uh, situation, you're trying to go to the staff at Netflix and you're saying, you know, what writers are you excited about? And then you find those writers and match them to the comics you have. And so what we're trying to do is serve Netflix as many great projects as we can. 
And so it's an incentive, companies that have first look deals, it's an incentive for a deeper collaboration between the two companies. Now, one of the questions we get a lot from viewers and we'd like for you to explain as well is that first look deal, that doesn't actually entail those licensed properties with Boom Studios, right? It's, right. it's more yeah. of the creator owned licenses. Yeah, the Hasbro owns and controls the Power Rangers and Hasbro has a deal with Paramount and with E1, they bought E1. So um, that is something I can't even speak to because I don't even pay attention to it because it doesn't have anything to do with us. Well, that was a, that's another question. It's not on our outline, but it's one that I, I always find fascinating is the um, kind of balance of, of different types of properties that Boom Studios is constantly um, involved in. You guys are not only doing creator own properties, but you have these licensed properties. Um, and certainly the licensed properties were uh, so key to the uh, beginning stages of Boom Studios. Do you foresee in the future licensed properties still staying as kind of like a pillar of Boom Studios? Absolutely, as long as we can do them well. Mm -hmm. And what we have found as a company is when we sign up licenses that we're doing because we think that they're commercial and they'll sell books and we don't genuinely care about them, it doesn't work out. Mm. You know, we have active conversations all the time, like every other week about licenses. And we have turned down a lot of things that go to be published other places or uh, just languish on the vine, which we just don't feel uh, an affinity for. And so, you know, it maybe it's a bad commercial decision, but we're just real passionate. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do it because we believe that we can bring something unique to the process. Well, let me ask you this, like a utopian, utopian world, Ross Ritchie, we all know one of the things we like about Ross, one of the things we like about Boom is Ross is a comic person at heart, loves comic Good books. Lord, just, yes. We do. We've sat at, had lunch at one point and just talked nothing but comics. It was a fantastic conversation. With that being said, if you could have any license to come over to Boom for Ross Ritchie, which would Ooh, you pick? I wasn't ready for this. I, I was literally going to ask the same question. That was a great job. You, you just teamed up on me. Jeez Louise. <laughs> it wasn't premeditated. It just came up and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. It makes sense. Well, you know what? I'm going to. You could say, gonna... say Masters of the Universe. That's cool. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I'm going to disappoint both of you, and I'm going to give you the answer that you don't want. Bionic man. I'm going to give you the uh, fanboy emotional. I will tell you, I just bought, IDW just put out this um, Michael Golden Micronauts uh, artist edition. Mm. And I bought the signed in number $200 one, and I just got it. It's glorious. And that's the book I read when I, I read issue three when I was like eight and I've just never gotten over it. And of course it can't be published that exact same way because half the rights are with Marvel and half the rights right. are with Hasbro. But I do know, I, you know, I've got my signed Michael Golden first issue uh, at CGC with a gold label uh, because they, I, I, this is not my company and I have nothing to do with this, but I have it on good authority that that Micronauts movie is pretty serious over at Hasbro. So I, I would, I would bet that the Hasbro stuff is um, the next stuff. I think that is going to be big in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, am I going to get three times my money from you, Jack, when I flip that? Yes. Yes. And yeah, you knew I was sitting here. I was sitting here rooting. I just said, say any of the Hasbro properties, GI Joe, of course, but I right. would love to see, I would love to see all the Hasbro properties under one house. I'll say that. And I think you guys have done an amazing job with uh, uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and really set a standard with that book. So thank uh, you. That's, that's kind of, that would be my dream scenario. Otherwise, I, you well, guys, up to Hasbro. Yes. But you guys do a great job with like all ages stuff as well. And I look at some of the stuff like um, the old Bongo comics with uh, the Simpsons. Oh, yeah or um spongebob um or uh even like pokemon with a regular vid. show who, um, yeah. who do i murder to get the license for pokemon right well how big would that be right oh now? my good googly moogly could you imagine well and here's the thing is i started reading comics when i was six mm -hmm. so you know that's what really fueled my interest in kaboom is you know who and, and look now okay now i'm gonna get a little chippy all right. So when I started doing Kaboom, 
I was told by people, and I will tease my friends at Diamond, whom I adore, kids don't read comics. So I was told, what are you doing? And it wasn't just Diamond. It was everybody. This is a terrible idea. What are you thinking? And so we, we are not the sole uh, uh, sort of like prime mover in the modern kids comic market. There are things like Diary of a Wimpy Kid that predate us. Okay. And there was, you know, Scholastic was collecting bone and coloring it and putting it out. So, you know, I'm not so naive or egotistical that I can't um, recognize those things. But I'll tell you in the direct market, absolutely. We, you know, nowadays, one of my biggest career accomplishments that I, I will always be proud of is most stores, when you walk in the front, there's a front section that has kids' comics. Yeah. And that was, didn't exist before Kaboom. So another thing I want to talk about, I, I think you might have gotten this idea from watching Jack and I so much, but you started your own YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, so, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. yes. A little tongue in cheek there, but awesome. I, know, I, I, I love it. I love it. Look, here's the thing. I what here's what I wanted to do. Like I sit here and I watch you guys. I watch all the usual suspects that you would think that I watch. And uh, I, I'm so excited about this space. And I think this is so cool. You know, this is so much fun. I, I love the perspective and I love the enthusiasm and the heart that's expressed. And it just gets me fired up as a fan. And I was looking at, you know, I am so blessed and so fortunate by the creative people that I have access to. And I think about, the kind of conversations that I have with these creative people. And they would often, you know, I've done panels, they've done panels. A lot of times you're talking about whatever is the new book that you're putting out, which you should be doing, right? You should be marketing your book. But, you know, you might have an hour that gets chopped into 40 minutes at Baltimore Comic Con or Heroes Con or New York or whatever. And you don't really get a chance to talk about the creativity and the heart and the soul that's behind it. And I thought, you know, there are so many podcasts that go real deep. You know, they go into an hour. You know, I'm a huge fan of Terry Gross's Fresh Air. And she really analyzes the creative process. I love Mark Marin, who talks to, you know, amazing celebrities. And of course, there's- Joe only, Rogan's one that everyone's well aware Rogan's of. Rogan's a great example. Absolutely. Yeah. And I looked at that and I was like, you know, I have the opportunity to be able to go deep with a huge creative Rolodex. And so I launched the first episode is with uh, James Tynan IV. And, you know, James is somebody that Boom published from the beginning. You know, uh, we put out The Woods back in 2012 when he was just starting to get into creator-owned material. And uh, we've had a huge hit with Something is Killing the Children. And I just knew, I, you know, known James forever. And I just knew that we could get into a deep conversation, which James would enjoy, talking about growing up in Wisconsin and, you know, like uh, my joke with Tynan is, you know, he was talking about when Borders was big back 20 years ago, he was the kid, he didn't have a comic shop and he didn't have a, a driver's license. And so he was the kid that would go to Borders and would read uh, all these graphic novels. Mm -hmm. And so my joke with him was I was stepping over you, you know, cause I, whenever I went to Borders, there was always a bunch of kids that were in the aisle you know, and I had to get past them to be able to get to the graphic novel I was going to buy. So it's just really fun. I think in particular, you know, I've started to raise my, my profile on Instagram. And one of the things that's really consistent that I could really see in a way that I hadn't done previously with Instagram, well, I couldn't have seen it without Instagram, is there's a whole new generation of people that they don't know anything about making comics. They are excited about the movies. There, a lot of them are jumping into collecting and buying and reading now, and they don't understand process at all. And the thing is, is, uh, you know, I, as when I was growing up, there was Comic Buyer's Guide. Uh, I loved, there was a newsstand magazine from Starlog that was called Comic Scene. And I learned about inking from Comic Scene. And then it explained what does an inker do? You know, and there's no sources nowadays that tell fans how do you make a comic? And in particular, 
you know, I put, I, I put my head up on Instagram and I just get buried in direct messages, which are like, publish me. Right. All right. And, and, and my example on publishing is like, you don't go to a basketball game, an NBA basketball game. Remember when we had those? Right. Well, I, guess <laughs> right, we, right. I guess we just did, but I, I can't make it. You can't anyway. go to them. Yeah. You can't go to them. Right. You remember when you could go buy a ticket to an NBA basketball game and like who in their right mind would be in the bleachers and would come down to the coach and say, put me in. Right. The audacity right? of that. Right. Well, the a lot thing of people is, had that dream though. Right. <laughs> Right. Well, we all do. Right. But the, but the thing about it is, is the people that are coming down and asking to be put in, you, you know, I, I think it's audacious, but they just don't understand yeah, because people are not talking about it. Right. And so I looked at it as an opportunity and I was like, look, how do we communicate to the next generation and explain to them the concept of 10,000 hours? You know, and I think the time in interview is revelatory. Because he figures out early on, he's going to be a writer. And he puts every single waking moment towards that goal. And he makes huge sacrifices and major choices. And it worked out. And that's a huge blessing for him. And for other people, it's scary, right? Because you put all your eggs in one basket. James puts all, all his eggs in one basket in like, when he's like 16. I mean, it's nuts. And I think there's so much value in what you're doing too, beyond um, I, certainly uh, from teaching people the creative process, but also I, I think the tie in episode is a prime example of that. We're starting to see a return to maybe that early nineties era where you're starting to get some stars being made within our industry, at least with, within the community. And tie is a prime example of that where um, between something's killing the children and, and Batman um, yep. and then coming off of that and going department of truth. Um, he has become a hit maker. Um, and I, you mentioned the woods and I said earlier that I, I was, you know, I'm a big fan of that book. I remember shortly after that book was maybe on issue six or seven, he was at heroes con and I was getting books signed and graded by him. He was amazed at that point that somebody would want to grade autograph. yeah and grade it and like that he was asking me how that process was and why you know and, and to look at where he is today um from that and i think that people they've become fans of donny cates and they've become fans yeah. of james tynan and tom taylor and al ewing but they did to learn more about these people and and what motivates them and where they're coming from rather than just kind of judging everything on Twitter, I think you, you're you going to be able to provide a unique perspective from that. Plus, you've got Brian and I, you know, we, we come from a fan perspective um, and we can and we can and you certainly can touch on that. But you can also touch on the fact that you've got experience in the industry and you may not even realize it. But when we have conversations with you, we pull things from those conversations that then stick with us. I can't tell you how many times Brian and I have quoted in the last year a comment you said to us that may have been a throwaway comment about how uh, it's your backstock inventory that's going to make you and and not to short be short-sighted with that. And we have really kind of lived on that principle and not been afraid of that and not um, uh, lived in the pre-order process. And I think that that's been uh, something that kind of changed our thinking on that. And that came from us talking to somebody with that kind of experience. So I think you you provide a platform where it's sort of like um, when you're watching the the sports shows, uh, you know, Brian and I can we can be Ernie Johnson, but you know, you you you're you're Chuck, you're Shaq, you've got you've got the credibility we don't have. Well, and it, and it, but it's all about perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, and and I just look at it from a fan's perspective. Like, there's this great show on Netflix called Exploder, uh, Song Exploder, and uh, I love REM, and so they do a um, breakdown of the song losing my religion and you know i've heard that song a million times but you sit down with michael stipe the lead singer and he starts the story with um i love every breath you take by the police now i would have never connected those two things and basically once you you know if you know losing my religion it's that's me in the corner that's me in the spotlight losing like basically when you start to read the lyrics you see the alienation of uh, every breath you take. And there's like a distance in the relationship of every breath you take is he, someone longing for someone else, right? 
and losing my religion, there's this sense of like separation and fear. And, and they're related in this crazy way that doesn't make any sense on the surface of it. But when you hear Stipe talk about it, and like, I just sit there, you know, like one of the things about Boom that's so much fun is I get to be the fan that gets to read the comic first, right? Like I by, get to by be, the way, for the younger viewers watching, those would, might be found on the Classic Rock channel now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Earns that. Earns that. Thank if, you. If welcome to the, I, I heard Welcome to the Jungle was on a Classic Rock channel. <laughs> list, so oh, I'm, oh I'm sure at this point, REM. I, oh, sure. for sure. I'm sure. For sure. For sure. But, but it's like, you know, the, the grand irony with Boom is that I get to build something where they make the comics that I love and I get to be the first fan to read them. It's like a front row ticket that I get for free. I get paid to have a front row ticket. And so to me, it's like having that experience and being able to share that experience with the audience of, we get to sit here and talk to James Tynan and I get to ask him any question I wanna ask him. You know, he didn't have to answer, but I get to sit there and nerd out with him the way that I would if we were at a con and we were having dinner together. And then you get to be there and to me, I, my hope and my prayer is that somebody, that there's a little Tynan out there that's watching that YouTube and they're like, oh, that's how you got to write Batman. That's awesome. That's how you broke in. That's how you, you know, because that's at the end of the day, it's like we need to encourage uh, the entire community. And I know, you know, like I know that retailers are going to just love this show. And I know there's going to be fans. And I know, you know, it's like, it just, it helps everybody. I mean, that's my aspiration. I hope that people watch it. I hope they check it out. And I know there's going to be a bunch of people that are going to be like, it's too long and there's too much detail, but that's fine. The, there's other shows for them to watch that are shorter. This is just what I want to do. And I have the luxury of being able to do it. I'm just trying to share my perspective. And then for our viewers, can you let them know the name of your YouTube channel? Uh, yes, it is the Ross Ritchie channel. So we'll also put a link to that in the description as well as Ross's other social. He's on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We'll put links to all those in the description of this video if you want to check that out. Thank yeah, you. Definite major bolo on Ross's channel. We want to make sure that everybody is checking that out. So everybody go make sure you subscribe. And after you subscribe, come comment on this video. Say, I'm subscribed. And we're going to enter you in a giveaway for a very special edition of a bolo box, our mystery box. And this is a Boom Studios edition. We have been creating some exclusives with Boom Studios. And with this box, you are going to get four exclusives made by Simpleman's Comics and the 616 Comics from Boom Studios. So again, that's four exclusive. That's a $100 value free. And all you've got to do is go subscribe to Ross's channel and comment on this video and say that you are subscribed. And thank you. And let me point out, it is not the Boom Studios uh, YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel. It does very well. This is my personal channel. Yep. Thank you. All right. So let's, you, want, you ready to talk about wind? Let's do it. All right. So, um, you know, COVID, lockdown, craziness. We all remember when there was that time period uh, when Diamond shut down. And uh, I wasn't getting my Simple Man's Comics YouTube episodes i had i had like a little video on instagram for my weekly hall picks that day and it was all like iou comics mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and there were no comics coming out and i'll tell you man i was concerned and we all were and uh but then when things started to open back up you know one of the things that boom did that i'm very proud of is we did not let anybody go at the company and I believe that every other company in comics did. And I don't blame them because you have to make adjustments. And when you have the industry shut down for two months like it did, uh, you got to make some hard choices. But we made a hard choice. And the choice that we made was we're going to keep everybody and we're going to push forward. And more than just keeping the staff, we did not go pencils down we kept at all the writers and artists working. Now we, we listened to retailers and retailers asked us to trim our line. So we pushed 10% back into, into 2021. 
but we kept the Power Rangers guys writing and drawing. We kept, you know, the Something is Killing the Children team, Once in Future, everybody forward, forward, forward. Now, when we came out of it, what we saw was fans didn't have anything to buy. Mm -hmm. And that was mind blowing. You know, it was incredible to see how the comic book community had rallied around comic shops and they cared and they supported their local comic shop. And so once that was clear, we started to have a conversation internally at Boom. Like, I'll give you an example of we, the, the Power Rangers launch, the new number one, and the Mighty Morphin number one launch, we kept on our schedule exactly, it was originally at that point, and we kept it there. And with the missing two months, we worked hard to ship all the Power Rangers lead up to that and keep it in place. And it was because we saw that shops needed something to sell. And so we were having a conversation every week, sort of looking at the retailers, listening to their forums and what they're talking about, and working hard to try to be able to rise to meet the occasion, to be able to supply the market with material. And one of the things that we had was we had a graphic novel that was coming out from Tynan and Michael Dialinus, his Woods collaborator called Wind. And during that time period, you know, I got the cockamamie idea of let's take wind, it's done, okay, let's break it into individual issues, and let's serialize it in the direct market. And my president of publishing, Philip Sablik, said, you know, that's great, but we've missed the solicitation cycle. So, you know, if you send it to Diamond to put in previews now, it'll be six months before it actually you get your orders. And I said, yeah, I don't care. And we called up Diamond and we said, we're going to skip the previous catalog and we're going to go straight to FOC and we're going to solicit this thing digitally. And no one's ever done that before. Okay. Now, the first thing I did was I called Tynan and I said, hey, you know, I'm the boom guy. I got a boom for you. This is crazy. What if we do this? Okay. And the thing about it is James didn't hesitate. He was all in for how crazy it was. And the thing that was the huge risk was we had five days from Tynan saying yes and us sending out the press release to collect orders. Five days. So typically you have 90 days from, you know, sort of like it hitting the previous catalog all the <clears> way through <throat> the process to the FOC. And did you have to get like variant uh, cover art during that yeah. period of time as well? Because uh, you mean that that certainly that Peach Romoco incentive was a, a real driving force for the sales of that issue, number one. And then throughout the series, as she's continued on doing incentives. Yep. Yeah, it was, to, a, it was insanity. You, did, you had a Sorry. preview for it in what? Uh, Something's Killing Children number seven, I believe. Seven. Right? Yeah. So well, first that, appearance that, right there. That's true. It's true. And. And uh, I didn't say this, but if I were you, I would keep an eye on that. There you go. Um, like that. So, uh, you know, it, it, like, it was an insane crunch. And, you know, we were nothing but thankful. And, you know, we owe it to the retailers and we owe it to the fans uh, that it paid off. And, you know, that book became our biggest first print. Um, you know, the subsequent printings of something is killing children once a future went over 50,000 copies, but that book sold nearly 40 in the first print. And then that set up seven secrets and it set up, we only find them when we're dead and the, just the escalation that went, went from there. But, um, you know, I really kind of think about life, you know, you've got to pay attention, realize the situation you're in, and then you've got to take that situation and do the best you can. Uh, you, and you guys certainly maximize that situation. You mentioned momentum. Um, that's kind of been a big key for you, for you guys. You had you saw that with uh, Once in Future, Something's Killing the Children, and that momentum started to build going into uh, folklore. And then this year, we saw it with Wind and then Seven Secrets. We only find them when they're dead. And it seems like 2021 is not going to be any different as we move into a absolute major release with Matt Kent and Keanu Reeves and Berserker, uh, something that we've kind of been talking about for a while. We've known for a little bit longer than that, and it's been kind of like 
one of the most highly anticipated books uh, I can think of from a creator owned property. So uh, share with us how that all came to be and, and, and what we can expect. Well, I uh, mentioned earlier that we have a media team that's dedicated to making movies and TV shows. And so we, we have offices on the Fox lot. And so just for those keeping track at home, we have a first look deal with um, Netflix, but we also have a feature film deal with uh, what was Fox and is now 20th Century. And so we have our offices on that lot and we got a phone call that Keanu wanted to come pitch us a comic book. So these are good things to have incoming calls like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I turn around twice and I find myself sitting down on the couch and Keanu Reeves is standing in front of me and he's physically acting berserker out. And I'll tell you, here's what Keanu, here's how, like, like Jack, tell me if you'd say yes to this pitch. Okay. Okay. And then, and then maybe we'll yes. let Brian. Let, <laughs> you say we'll Keanu, let yes. Brian no, have some input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Keanu walks up and he goes, I just really, and he pulls his fist back and he's like, I just want to punch a dude through the chest. I just want to punch dudes through the chest. And I was like, I mean, he's standing, acting it like he's lunging across the room. Like, I was just like, I was completely enraptured. And then basically he sort of spun out a bunch of different ideas where it was like, this character is immortal. He goes all the way back to Babylon. You know, he's been hiding in the world's wars. So he talked about like a Napoleonic war where like you see the battlefield and, you know, th just the wreckage of all the dead corpses and all the smoke and the cannons and everything. And you just see one of the corpses get up and kind of dust itself off and walk off into the woods because he was pretending he was dead so that he could use the war as cover for his immortality. And so uh, he just spun this sort of massive epic saga that had a lot of emotion and a tremendous amount of heart. And we got to the end of it and he said, and we'll get Raphael grandpa to do the cover. Now, if that isn't somebody smacking you upside the head and saying, I know my comics, right? Right. Like I have taste, I care, I'm paying attention. And Oh, by the way, if you try to talk me out of Raphael grandpa, I, I, I you know, I, I'm not going to be happy about it because I got real specific and it shows a certain amount of like artistic, you know, uh, sort of like uh, high end taste. Yeah. And of course, you know, we were thrilled to hear he was excited about Raphael Grandpa. And, you know, then, it, you know, as we went on to develop the story, he, you know, he told stories about buying Wolverine, the limited series number one by Chris Claremont and Frank Miller off the rack. And so, you know, it is clear through the years that he has always been interested in comics. He loves Jeff Darrow. He loves like, there's just a huge list of comic book creators that he loves. So, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's everything. Keanu is everything that you want him to be. You know, he is kind, he's considerate. You know, the story I love to tell is we took a lot of meetings doing story conferences on the, on the uh, storyline. And by the way, if you think that this is something that Keanu handed off to Matt Kent to do, you're wrong. Keanu workshops this thing four hours at a time. We probably had 12 meetings of just story, story, story. Um, the first meeting he came in and sat down and um, he was waiting in reception for just a little bit, uh, mainly because I think I was crapping myself in the other room, trying to figure out how to like act cool. And then in the next meeting, he came in and when he came into uh, reception, um, he started talking to our assistant there and he was like, Hey, how's your dog doing? Hey, how's your friend? Is your friend get feeling better? And I was like, Oh my gosh, he remembers everything right. that she said and he kept track of it and he's following up, you know, and like, I can't remember, I got the grocery store. I can't remember what my wife sent me to go buy, you know? So, um, you know, he's just kind, he's considerate, he's brilliant and focused. And I'll tell you one thing, man, you do not get to be somebody that has a career like that for 35 years in the movie business without being really, really good. 
Yeah, and we saw he, uh, just from our end, um, we've been working to produce exclusive variants for the first issue. Um, and there was, from the time that we got our art in, we were all excited, right? We thought we were going to be able to go show everybody. We got an artist that I don't even know if we're allowed to say the name, but I'll say it's an artist. We were excited um, to get on board to do this. And uh, then Morgan, who does coordinates that entire program for you guys, she is amazing, um, kind of hit hit the brakes with us and, and brought us back to reality and told us that like Keanu himself has to sign off on all of these, uh, you know, depictions of the character. Um, and even though we had what we felt like was a top tier artist and we were extremely proud of our covers that we, we were sweating waiting what felt like forever um, to kind of get the approval that, okay, Keanu likes it. And then even though, we didn't draw it when we finally got the, the word back that, yeah, he liked it. It was like the best feeling. If it was, <laughs> it was like NASA center, man. Yeah. We're all like, touchdown. <laughs> yeah. It was like, all right. Cause we started doubting ourselves during that process because at first we were sitting there, we're like, Oh, there's no way he's not, this is amazing. And then we're, I don't know, man. <laughs> he knows what he's looking for, and <laughs> he's a well, and I, I, I will, I will uh, burnish your Greek, your geek cred by telling you that you probably got approved on the set of The Matrix Four. That's so, real cool. That's real cool. Yeah. That's and and you know, just think about think about this is when Keanu was shooting Matrix Four, so he's doing insane wire work, you know, high level martial arts. Uh, the full the full thing the full 12 hours every day in Berlin so he's doing that Monday through Friday and then you know Saturday Sunday he's in Berserker land so you know that is like you know I certainly I could barely get off the couch and focus on what I'm going to do next so I can't even begin to imagine what uh you he know. really is immortal <laughs> right. well you know he's in he's he's in incredible shape he looks like he's you know 35 and uh, the guy can, you know, those stunts, he does his own stunts. So Yeah, I'd like to see uh, somebody pass up a, a first look opportunity at Berserker with Keanu Reeves. I don't, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's happening. But. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Well, we can't talk about Berserker without talking about one of, I thought, the most, I know everybody's got a take on this, um, but mine is that it was one of the most creative and unique um kind of companion releases i've ever seen in your kickstarter program uh where you guys released uh pre-orders for the entire first series 12 12 issues right through yep. um through uh hardbound editions uh with all kinds of different treatments and um embellishments and all kinds of different tiers there was even an, a, a tier that had availability to get keanu's autograph which that was something we talked about with arun at the time i don't think people realize yet how rare keanu's signature is they do like, not you're not gonna get a bunch of cgc signed books out there uh yep. signed by keanu so um those signatures are, are I, that sold out quickly. I expect that to be, but you guys did an enormous number um, with that Kickstarter. Can you tell us One, about what 1.7 million, but who's keeping track 1.7 million. Um, and I won't even say when we originally discussed it with the room, like the number we were talking about, but it wasn't 1.7 million. <laughs> So uh, um, that's one of those things. Can you tell us how, like, how, what was the idea for that? Um, how did you deal with the reaction from the market and some of the retailers who maybe didn't see the big picture of what you were trying to do? Well, the thing that I, I always center myself in, you know, sort of what is the opportunity? And so, you know, I would find myself in a situation where, you know, Keanu wanted to do this book. He was super excited. We knew that we could take it to the direct market. It would be amazing. But, you know, I'd go to bed and I'd be thinking, you know, one of the things that really drives me with Boom is how do we get more people to read comics? Yes. Like, you can find people that, like, let me back up for a second. You cannot find anybody who hasn't seen a movie, hasn't watched a TV show, hasn't read a novel, you could find people who never read comics. Like, what are we doing to change that? Yeah. 
Especially and, for the longest time, I had that stigma. <laughs> you read right. Comments? Absolutely. And the thing is, is like you see in our publishing, Lumberjanes. Lumberjanes is something that like my, one of my local retailers, uh, Pulp Fiction in Culver City, she started her store because of Lumberjanes, right? Like that to me, when I look back at my life and I go, what's my legacy? You know, I hope that I can spread this thing that I love so much. You know, we, we're putting out Roxane Gay um, has this book, The Sacrifice of Darkness. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She wrote this yeah. book called Bad Feminist. She's a huge, like she goes on, you know, uh, talk shows. You know, she goes on Bill Maher on HBO and like, you know, she's a huge pundit. That's a big deal. And it's like getting her to write a comic book so that people that read Roxane Gay, they would never read a comic book. Or, uh, you know, the Slaughterhouse Five graphic novel we just did. We had to talk Kurt Vonnegut's estate into doing that project because they thought comic books were archy, you know, and we talked them into it. Stephen Christie did an amazing job uh, getting them to see w the literary value of this. So it's like, how do you get, like Keanu Reeves is a massive opportunity. And how do you get people to read comics? And the thing is, is, you know, that if you explain to a civilian, well, you know, it's 22 pages a month and it's, you know, four bucks an issue and they're spaced out 30 days apart. And sometimes it, it goes 37 or sometimes it goes 42 and, you know, you need to, it's like, no, right. I mean, one of the glories of graphic novels is that that has really opened a window. I mean, how many people have read Watchmen that have never read a comic book before because it's all contained in right. one thing, right? So how do we get them? Now, Amazon has a process that's super complicated and really hard where you could pre-order all three volumes or you could use Kickstarter, which everybody knows what it is and have one click and you could pre-order all three volumes and you have separate shipping charges where we could ship the book to you. Now, what we knew was we can set this up, like I'm gonna get really ticky tacky here and I'm gonna break it down, okay? The thing is, is with retailers that are huge to boom, which are our first priority and are the most important thing, okay? We knew the, the bottom tier was three soft covers. Let's say roughly, we haven't priced the soft cover for, um, uh, for Berserker yet, but basically think of it as like, let's say it's $14.99. It might be $15.99, whatever. It's $14.99, right? 15 bucks times three, 45 bucks, okay? The lowest tier is $50 now, and that's before shipping, okay? Now we did that on purpose because we didn't want direct market fans to be ordering their graphic novels through Kickstarter, okay? We wanted people that had not read comics to order through Kickstarter. So now you could go to your local shop and you can sign up for all three volumes and it'll be like 45 bucks and you don't have to pay shipping. So it's a cheaper price to get at your local comic shop. And some shops, if you pre-order, do discounts. As a matter of fact, most of them do, right? And so with that framework and that approach, our attitude was we can price this in such a way that it doesn't gouge the people on Kickstarter, but it disincentivizes a direct market fan from wanting to go to the Kickstarter and order from the Kickstarter instead of ordering from their local retailer. And one of the things that I did was I targeted 15 of the most prominent retailers in the business. And all the names that you're thinking of, all the people that you've seen that raise a hue and cry, that are the most vocal dudes that everybody's scared of, I picked up the phone and I called them one by one. And I said, let's have a conversation. This is what we want to do. And I want to hear if I'm wrong. Now, the key to this is we're serializing in the direct market first. Okay, That happens first, just like every Boom comic. And then we go through all four issues and then we collect it into a trade and that goes to the direct market first, just like everything else. And it goes to the book market next, just like everything else. And then it goes to the Kickstarter fulfillment. So the window for retailers to be able to have the product exclusively is pretty massive. And through that process, you know, we're going to be mailing out pledges. You understand how the post office works. Those guys are not getting the book tomorrow, right? So, you know, People, but the people that are on Kickstarter, they don't care, right? They want to do one click, they want to buy the book, and they want to get it in the mail, and they don't want to think about it again, right? 
Now, in the and a lot of times on Kickstarter, it's not like, hey, I want to get it, but I'm not like chomping at the bit. I'll get it when it comes. Right, right. That's how I order on Kickstarter. Like I sometimes I hate getting updates where I'm like, mm. stop sending me stuff. I just want to get the book. Right. Like I'm cool. You know, I'm not upset or anything. It's just like send me the book. And so but then meantime, we had an opportunity, which is we had a huge mailing list of people that signed up for Keanu. Right. And we can send them an update when the first issue launches in comic shops. And we could basically say, hey, this book is coming to you, you know, five to six months later. But if you want to go to a comic shop right now, you can buy the first chapter. Right. And understand it's just the first chapter, but there's all these different collectible covers. If you're interested in that, if you're not, no worries, your book's still coming. And so, I, you know, you know who Larry's Comics is? Oh, yeah. We know, we know, we know Larry Doherty. Right. So Larry sent me a message and was like, hey, I'm getting phone calls from people that are signing up for the Berserker book that are piano fans. Right. They're just signing up in a store for, mm-hmm. with a pull list and they've never bought a comic before. So and, and I got sporadically some other messages from some other folks that I can't recall off the top of my head, but we're seeing it and the books doesn't, you know, it's not going to come out until February. So, yeah, I think I think it has an opportunity to bring so many people from outside of comics because they, it, it you know, they, they see Keanu and you can immediately it, a lot of the things we talk about, obviously, we're spe- especially when we talk about the, the, the speculative side of collecting, when you start talking about trying to project uh, uh, something to another form of media. When you talk about, you know, movies and stuff, you can see it on the page with Keanu. You can see it on every cover. Uh, it, it, it's right there. And then the idea that this is a story that's written by him, um, that he put his passion into it, that you guys have been working on for a number of years. Uh, yes. it, it's it's one of those things that uh, I think that not only is the comic community going to be excited, but we get an opportunity every every few years. It seems like where there's an opportunity to expand our market base, and it, I really what I appreciate is that you're taking very seriously the opportunity that you have before you, and what it can do for the hobby. Because my hope is that some of those people that pick up a a a set on Kickstarter who are not comic people, when they get that set in, whenever they do, and they read it, and they see that Boom Studios logo, if they love it, maybe that brings them to their comic shop to look for something else with that Boom Studios logo, which then exposes them to that Image Comics logo, and that IDW logo, and everybody else who's making great comics. Uh, And I think that, you know, that's what we have to do as a, especially a readership to uh, kind of bring in more. We, there, we all know the gimmicks that can be done with variants and with exclusives that can drive sales temporarily, but the only way we're ever going to get that long-term growth is through new readers. And look, you know, I will tell you as a publisher, what I want is I want really great image comics in the stores. I want great IDW mm-hmm. comics, Dark Horse comics, Marvel comics, DC comics. I want fans excited. I want those stores rocking. When that happens, when like, look, we've all experienced it. There's the weeks when you're like, uh, I don't know. Do I even need to go? Right. And then there's the weeks where you can't wait to get there. And the weeks that you can't wait to get there, it benefits everybody. We need every comic book company to do great. And that's, I'm always cheering for that. Well, you put out that statement that almost that your Jerry Maguire manifesto, um, where you talked about cutting down on the number of titles that publishers are putting out, listening to the retailers about that, and to really put more energy and effort into the titles that you do release, which is where I think you guys win, is the way you guys market your books, the way you guys, uh, the, the, the passion and promotion that go into each individual title, which it, it doesn't seem like you're just moving on to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. Um, and. I think we've started to see some other publishers a little bit at least follow suit. And I remember Brian and I talking when DC Comics undoubtedly had to do a lot of those cuts were COVID related. Um, But when they talked about cutting down the publishing line and Jim Lee was trying to explain it, we we were joking saying, this is really, he's just explaining the same thing Ross Ritchie was talking about, where if you cut... You cut you cut the amount of books that you're releasing. You're going to be able to to put more into the ones that you've got, and you're not going to overwhelm shops. And you're going to make sure you're putting out quality. Um, and I, I think that I hope that that is a trend we continue 
to see over the next year, two years, because it got crazy a few years ago. It did get to a point of just being overwhelming. Well, look, it's a natural, you know, I've been reading comics since 1976, and it's an ebb and a tide where, um, you know, there, we remember after the Turtles in 1984, you know, there was the black and white bust around 1987. And that was because too many, too much publishing. And then 10 years later, he had a big bust in the entire industry in 1996. And so, you know, it's like you go through these ebbs and flows. We cut um, the year before, this year because of COVID, we cut 10%. And the year before we cut it, I think it was 13%. And so, um, and, you know, our sales have gone up. So, you know, I, it's just a simple, anybody can tell you, you know, you got to uh, cut your releases. You got to make sure each one is the level that it needs to be. And, um, you know, it's a high quality and great product that you market. Real quick, before we close, one, the first thing I want to say is that's one crazy con you're at because that guy in that blue shirt behind you has been staring at something ah. the, whole, <laughs> the whole time. But uh, you had mentioned <laughs> HBO Max, you mentioned Lumberjanes, you got a big picture of Lumberjanes behind you. We actually, I say we, you at Boom Studios, Lumberjanes is actually coming to a close, right? Here within December? Yes, that's right. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up Lumberjanes. Uh, now, I'm not sure that anybody could count on that being the last that they ever see of the Lumberjanes. So uh, I don't think that's what we're saying, but we had a run of 75 issues. And I think uh, Rich Johnson on Bleeding Cool pointed out, I believe, that uh, I'm not sure that anybody's ever had 75 issues continuously that were written, drawn, and uh, done completely by women. So particularly proud of that for our ladies. I'm the father of two daughters. I've got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old uh, girls, and uh, they've grown up reading Lumberjanes. And so, um, you know, it's an, it, look, I think the thing I'm blown away by with Lumberjanes is that it connects to the audience in such a massive way. And, you know, there's a lot of things in this new HBO Max deal that make me believe that we, we have a real opportunity to go forward with this cartoon. Uh, and I think if this show gets on the air, that you're going to see, you know, little girls and women and some guys react to this on such a huge level. There's something embedded in the mythology of Lumberjanes that really connects to people. You know, I go to the American Library Association conference and, uh, you know, you have this sort of image of the librarian in your head. Uh, but what you're not prepared for is there are a bunch of Gen X chicks that have like tattoos and they've yeah. got piercings and they want people to read. And um, they're all Lumberjanes fans and they're all there all, all about Lumberjanes. And so, you know, we've had grand uh, grandmothers that love Lumberjanes. We've got grandfathers that love Lumberjanes. So, you know, it's just the thing. Lumberjanes is, you know, eternal. It's one of those things that everybody just really adores. So, you know, expect it to go through different iterations and different time periods. Well, and it's great too. You mentioned, uh, you know, your daughters uh, and people who watch the channel know that I've got two daughters, 10 and seven, and they're big reading the Adventure Time books right now. And I already told them, I said, hey, the, you're just going to get more. We can keep going with Boom Studios because you got Lumberjanes, you've got so many more titles as they get older, they can kind of just keep going. And uh, again, that's the balance of the, the publishing schedule that you guys have going on. Uh, so uh, we're sad to see the end of this Lumberjanes run, but good to know that that isn't probably going to be the last we're going to see of Lumberjanes. I think there will be more. What, what it will be and how it comes back, we'll see. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would just like to say this morning with my children, I was singing, Daddy, Don't Eat My Fries. <laughs> Adventure Time reference in case you yes, don't know. Yes, yes. I have I have my kids have a picture with Olivia Olson who's the voice of Marceline the the Vampire Queen who sings that song. So That's awesome. Math. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I, they also have a picture uh with John Carpenter. And <laughs> I look forward to someday them understanding who they got their picture taken with. Right. So, that's going to be a lot of fun. Earlier, you, you mentioned you had the story about James Tynan and the story of wind and how COVID happened. One of the things that we, Jack and I, 
talk, talk about on this channel all the time is how much Boom Studios does for the comic book fan, comic book retailers. And that's one thing we wanted to bring up also is you guys do things even more so, not just with COVID, but before that you were offering, you know, the, the returnable books, but then you increased yeah, that during COVID. Program. You did a bunch of other things. Can you go ahead and discuss some of the things you guys did to help comic book shops out during this whole COVID pandemic and how to kind of relieve some of those hardships? Absolutely. So we were looking at the situation and saying, if I'm a retailer and I'm going to open up my store post shutdown, how do I know that I'm going to have any fans that are going to show up? And if I'm in a situation where maybe fans are not going to show up and this is going to drag on for a really long time and we might go back into shutdown, why am I going to order anything past subs only or curbside pickup only or pre-order only? Right. And so what we thought was, you know, my attitude with retailers is retailers are our partners. And I mean that financially, right? So Boom has a 50-50 relationship with the retailers. Yeah, Diamond's in there and they take a slice, okay? But they take a very small slice, a minority slice. And it's a, it's a hand-in-hand partnership that we have with retailers. If retailers are not doing well, Boom is not doing well. So why wouldn't we want our retailers to feel that we care and we do. And I would rather put all my chips in the middle of the table and go down swinging than to pull back, get scared and live in a cave and have the whole world burn. So I looked at it and I said, look, let's give these guys the confidence and ladies confidence to know that they can order as much or as little as they want and we have their back. And let's ex- extend the boom returnability And we're going to extend it past first issues and we're going to extend it on a a timeline that they know that they can count on. And we extended it further than any other publisher. And we went out there really bold, you know, again, name of the company ain't whimper. And we're like, look, order the books, man. And here's the thing. If the, if the fans don't show up and you need to send those books back, you don't like, we're worried about you. You should be worried about us. Like we're in the boat together. Right. And thankfully, fans came out and they supported their shops and they bought those books. I'll tell you, Faithless was that first FOC. And I see that, Jack, you've got that there behind you. Yeah. Faithless was that first FOC. We FOC'd Faithless right before the shutdown. And literally, the book left the printer, okay, and it was sitting at Diamond when the shutdown happened. And then when Diamond turned the spigot back on, they re would that same book that was sitting there at the printer and it came back 3% higher. Mm. And the next week, it, the next FOC, which was already in the pipeline because those books were at the printer, they'd been printed, but they were sitting at the printer's docks and hadn't left yet. Those books came back 8% higher. And then the week after that was 8% higher and then bam, 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 and it just started to ascend. And... I think part of that is fans supporting retailers. And the other part of it is when the chips are down, you got to circle your wagons. You need to get together with your tribe, right? And retailers are our tribe and the fans are our tribe. We're going to supply product to these fans and we're going to do it hand to hand with the retailers. And we're going to not put a gun to retailers heads and say, well, you know, if you order these books and they don't sell, it's, you know, you're in trouble right? Not when the world is in the grip of this virus, right? We've got to sit here and make bigger decisions. We've got to take care of our own. And thankfully, that's what we did. And retailers responded. And we gave them a variety of other sort of uh, support mechanisms. One of the things that uh, Morgan did that was so brilliant was she did a uh, safe shopping on the website. So you could go to the website and you could search for a shop that was doing uh, safe shopping near you in your neighborhood. So, uh, you know, curbside pickup or, you know, whatever. And so that supported our retailers. I could keep talking about retailers until the cows come home, but got to take care of them. Yeah, and we, and we definitely want to give you guys a major kudos uh, for everything that you guys did and uh, to back the comeback and, uh, and certainly uh, the co- coming back strong and then all the success that you guys have had, uh, you certainly, certainly deserve it. 
Um, but Thank we want to we want to make sure that we give a, a, a little bit. Uh, we're going to give you a chance to kind of plug anything you want to plug. But we want to make sure that we throw a couple bolos out to the community. You mentioned your Instagram. Make sure you guys are following Ross Ritchie on Instagram. Um, there's a lot of value in his posts, uh, specifically for you you guys who like to resell, you you speculators, you flippers. He did some posts of the top five lowest printed somethings killing the children books, top five something uh, once and future books, way ahead of a lot of these books spiking on the secondary market that we now see uh, some of these incredible prices being paid for these late prints. And you could have gotten in on it early if you were following Ross Ritchie. So make sure you're doing that and make sure you are subscribed to Ross Ritchie's brand new YouTube channel. Great interview series, first episode up interviewing James Tynan. And make sure when you subscribe, you come back to this video. Let us know you subscribed in the comments section. We'll enter you to win that Boom Studio Simple Men's Comics exclusive Bolo box. Um, we're going to send one of those out, $100 value in that box. We're going to send one of those out for free to somebody in the community just for subscribing to get great video content from Ross Ritchie, CEO and founder of Boom Studios. But Ross, Thank you. What, what, thank you. What do you have going on? What else do people need to know? Where can they find you? Uh, let them know what your Instagram handle is, all of that good stuff. So my Instagram handle is Ross, R-O-S-S underscore Richie, R-I-C-H-I-E. Uh, no T, no E-Y. So that's R-I-C-H-I-E with an underscore in between. Now I'm going to do a little speed round. I know that your audience is interested in Hollywood. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, a recap on what is uh, under option that's been wow. announced and what isn't. So, um, so we know that Just Beyond is turning into a TV show. It's going to be on Disney Plus. Um, and so that is going to be shooting next year. Um, we have a show in production at Netflix that I'm not supposed to talk about. Shh. Um, then we've got the UCP it has the woods in development uh, for Peacock. And then um, I don't know if people are tracking, but, you know, Mimetic is yes. clicking along over at Lionsgate as a feature. Um, then we sold Snowblind in a bidding war to Apple um, as a movie with Jake Gyllenhaal, who is starring and producing that with us. Um, we've got a uh, Bolivar. Uh, which is still in development with Sean Levy, who's the executive producer of Stranger Things. And I'm going to leave that one alone. Um, and then um, oop, we've got um, uh, Last Sons of America got announced with Peter Dinklage, uh, Tyrion Lannister. Uh, and so you can't tell is... anything like that to Jack. He doesn't watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, Never seen an episode. Jack, uh, <laughs> you and I are going to have to... We're going to have to have some drinks and talk about that. <laughs> we'll um, have to. So The Unsound is a movie that got announced with David F. Sandberg, who directed Shazam. And so I, that's I just read that. That's incredible. On Netflix. Well, it's Colin Bunn. Colin's a yeah. genius. And Jack T. Cole is like a mad genius. So talented. Um, I'm going to remind everybody that Rashida Jones and Kerry Washington are making Goldie Vance. And I've seen some chatter on the web that uh, every single thing at Disney has been, uh, every single thing at Fox has been blown up by Disney. And that's not true. Goldie Vance is still going. Uh, and then uh, we've got HBO Max at Lumberjanes. Uh, I'm going to tease with you that we have something at Nickelodeon that's been unannounced. Uh, um, let's see. Then um, we've got Imagine Agents uh, with Sean Levy, again, the producer of Stranger Things. Uh, and that is uh, still a going concern. And then um, that's a super low print run book, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that first issue is like around six, seven thousand copies. Yeah, yeah. Um, then uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, we got stuff at Amazon that hasn't been announced. Uh, and then, of course, we had Empty Man that just came out. Uh, so that was fun. And then. Um, Let's see, we've got the UCP deal. I think that'll uh, that'll do the trick. We have 21 movies and TV shows. Yeah, so, just a few. So thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Much appreciated. This is too much fun. Yeah, It's going to be uh, crazy to sit on the couch and watch the show and see myself on it. Definitely. And also want to let the viewers know that this is available audio podcast as well. Uh, 
Can't say enough good things about Russ. Ross, you're always welcome on this channel. With that being said, guys, this is Jackie Brown, Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.